All right, so welcome to our nice season premiere, Script to Screen. I'm Matt Ryan, your host. Uh, today, we wanted to bring the Marvel Universe to the Pollock Theater. Uh, and the game grossed nearly $2.8 billion. Audiences around the world loved this, this for the cinematic art, the exploration of human, human conditions, the emotional journey of the characters, and of course, the spectacle. I want to thank Disney and Marvel Studios for letting us screen the movie in the Pollock, where movies truly belong and cinema art belongs. Uh, our guests have been integral in the MC universe since the beginning. They've written Captain America First Avenger, Winter Soldier, Civil War, and of course, Thor Dark World. By taking on Infinity War and Endgame, though, they were tasked with including some of our favorite character storylines, Captain America, Iron Man, Black Widow, and even Thanos. Today, today we're glad to have the real Avengers here. Please welcome the Pilot Theater stage screenwriters Chris and Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Hey, sir. Okay, so Infinity War grosses over $2 billion. It's a huge hit. Chump change. Chump change. Yeah. So you guys go with this idea to the studio. Let's do a movie about character trauma, mm -hmm. how it affects manifestos different in each superhero character. Yeah. Uh, we're going to kill off the main villain who had a great screen presence in the last movie. And we're going to hold back the action scene, the, bi the big battle scene to the third act. Yeah. How'd that pit session go at the studio? <laughs> Gangbusters. Yes. Uh, well, no, we, the, the beauty of it is, <laughs> you know, we didn't pitch that one after the first one came out. That would be a pretty panicky filmmaking experience. <laughs> you have one year to make the biggest movie in the world. Um, but they, you know, they were very, we got very little pushback for anything in a, in a weird way. I mean, partly it's because, you know, Kevin had made prior to Infinity War 18 successful movies that were pretty wide ranging in, in tone and in subject matter and in character popularity. And I think there was a certain level on the Disney executive side where they were like, we don't get what you're doing. <laughs> So just keep, just keep doing it. Um, and it was Kevin who was really like, just go for it and don't pull any punches and do that five year later gap and really, really make it mean something as opposed to the sort of false, false stakes of a cliffhanger. The, the, we were meant to stick the landing. That was the, from the very beginning was, and so the, the movies were codenamed Mary Lou one and Mary Lou two, you know, <laughs> for Mary Lou Retton, and, and we didn't talk about it because we didn't want to tell people we're going to go stick the landing, you know. But that was the idea. Or remind people who a gymnast from 1984 was. It's, this is now <laughs> how old I am and all this. But yes, yes. So I mean, but at the same time, you had to work with Kevin Feige, the president of Marvel. Mm -hmm. How did you? How was the initial conversation about how are you going to map this all out with the other 23 movies and interconnect them? What was that room meeting like? Well, the, it's, again, it's not any one meeting. We got the job. Um, just as we were about to shoot Civil War. So um, uh, that meant that during Civil War, Chris and I, during the downtime, uh, would just sort of plan all this out. And the, the rooms you're talking about are the last four um, months at first of 2015. And that's Chris and I locked in a room with, it's a serial killer's lair, right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> the, it's, or Carrie from Homeland, right? The, everything on the wall has like strings attached to it and three by five cards and little pictures of the characters in the Marvel Universe. And that's where the hard work of grinding and figuring out how to do what we wanted to do. And I should say, what did we want to do? Yeah. Wanted to lightly, we, we wanted to do the Thanos story, but there are many of them. We weren't going to be sort of beholden to any one thing. The only thing we were going to be beholden to was that. And then the second sort of missive was say goodbye to the original six Avengers. Mm -hmm. So that's what we In inherited. whichever way. In whatever that means. That needs yeah. to be done. Uh, so that's not like we said, here's what's going to happen. And then Kevin has to you know, shakily decide thumbs up or thumbs down. It's more like, how do we plow through the ideas to get to those two big moments? And we had generated like a massive amount of possibilities from the from the preceding movies and from the comic books and presented a like 60 page document to Marvel and said 
This, this is not a story. These are many, many different stories that you could be telling in, mm-hmm. with, the, with the strings you've laid out. Which of them do you like? You know, circle. Right. And literally they did, and we kind of flipped through and we like, everyone likes this. <laughs> That's um, right. And they were tiny or big, so that it, it gave us a sense of, of where, you know, which threads were really important to, mm-hmm. to carry through. Mm-hmm. So that by the time we got to those last four months, we kind of knew emotionally where we wanted a lot of the people to go. Well, we've got some little notes of both of the scripts. So um, the tone gets really dark, obviously, at the end of Infinity War when Spider-Man dies in Tony's arms. Mm-hmm. And you open with uh, you know, Hawkeye losing his family. Mm-hmm. What was the decision to end kind of in Infinity War that way and, and restart Endgame that way? Ah, well, the, sort of the secret is Endgame wasn't meant to start that way. Um, that scene with Hawkeye and his family was shot uh, uh, for the end of Infinity War. The idea would be that uh, Thanos would do this, he would have his sort of uh, metaphysical way station moment with young Gamora, and then you'd come back to see what happened. And the first inclination of what happened was some farm in the Midwest, and he's teaching a guy you haven't seen all movie, uh, and his family disappears on you. And then you'd go back to Wakanda, and people would disappear there, and you go back up to Titan and disappear there. Very first cut, everyone said, uh, oh, that's too jarring. It's too yeah. great. It's, it's, there's too much going on. You've got three places, blah, blah, blah. So I think Joe Russo said, let's put it at the beginning and see what happens you know, uh, of the next movie. And so I think it works great, mostly because it's, it's one of the few instances that you, the audience, are ahead of the character in the movie. We don't usually work that way. Um, And it gives you this lovely sense of dread because you're sitting there going, they're not going to kill those nice people. They're going to, are you? (laughs) They killed those people. I'm depressed all over again. Uh, Well, yeah, it it nicely has the effect of being a previously on the Avengers without without (laughs) doing that. It gives you that awful feeling that you had at the end of Infinity War again, so that you can rev up to the story plot. Yeah. And also the Spider-Man death kind of breathe a little too, like how, you know, the oh, pain yeah. from that mm-hmm. and they, for the fans to accept it. All right, so then did you always know you're whacking off uh, Thanos' head in the first 15 minutes? Or is that? That's, I'm not gonna, yes. Not gonna, yeah, <coughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, soon, because it was, uh, particularly important to us to not go where the immediate expectation was, which was, well, this is a movie where they remuster their forces and go to war against Thanos. You know, which always requires you to just sort of arbitrarily in the moment beat the guy who beat you before without a real right. change. Um, so killing him made that plot impossible. And we didn't really know what plot would come after that, but it seemed really important to get us into the emotional state of complete irreparability for everybody so that they could sit there for five years and grieve without the option of rebellion. So that there really was no way to fix the the, the thing they were in. It's a thing, particularly for you know, students, like it, it's, it takes a while for us to come up with this, but the idea that theme um, influences plot, right? The desire to roll around in the grief, right? To really own the ending meant that fixing it couldn't be a possibility. How do you make sure that the audience appreciates you can't fix it? Oh, kill the guy who did it and remove the stones, just they disappear. So you wrap it in saran wrap and say, this is the end of it. Mm -hmm. And it takes us a long time. And think, frankly, that idea, I think came up in the room when our executive producer turned Tran said, I just wish we could kill this guy because we couldn't figure out what to do with him, right? Because think about this, you've got a villain who is omnipotent and omniscient. Like, how are you going to defeat him? It's a, he's a ridiculous villain in that way. Like he's got no weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So, and so we you know, went around for weeks. How do we, what are we gonna do? Well, there's also, a, there's a tremendous satisfaction in where he winds up at the end of Infinity War wearing a t-shirt, sitting at a cabin, mm-hmm. and you don't want him to go, to, to change out of that and right. go back to being a warrior. He's done. Yeah. Yeah. He has accomplished his goal, he has no more story, he's done. And we wanted that to stay 
without having to backtrack on him. And, and you know, also you're messing with the story's uh, student, uh, audience's expectations. Yeah. Because you know, sure. we know they're going to get the time stone, they're going to erase everything that's, that's happened, because right. we've right. all seen time travel movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. I assume most people, uh, when they went to the movies that weekend, said, uh, this is the story about them getting back at Thanos, right? And then when his head rolls on the ground at minute 19, my hope is that most people go, I have no idea what's going to happen next. And that's a great place for us to get people to. Well, that's what happened when you had the collective sigh of five years later yeah. <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> and like, did that just happen? Um, writers rarely get this opportunity. You were able to kind of bring Black Widow and Captain America together years ago in mm -hmm. you know, Winter Soldier. Mm -hmm. How was it able to show their evolution and the relationship to the point of their first scene together? Kind ah. of bookend that your, your intro to them and actually that moment they had together in the opening of the movie. Mm. It's weird. I mean, they they come from nearly completely opposite places, uh, but they're quite similar in that they're both products of a government creating a soldier in a way. But she is pure dark, and he's pure light in effect. And they've wound up in the middle here. Well, they wound up nicely where Captain America was discovering that he was kind of really deep in the swamp, not to use the popular expression, and. And she was finding that she hadn't gotten out of the swamp that she'd been born in. And there, to find this, this unity of theme in these two really quite different characters was really satisfying. And those two are just great together. Like, right. when you put them together, it's just solid gold. Um, and the, I, I love the idea that they never got romantic, that they're, they're, they're friends. friends. And there's, there's a real power to seeing that on screen. And I did like the, how you did differently. Captain America is doing the support group thing, which was always great, his mm -hmm. thing. But Black Widow took the different approach. Right. We talked earlier, trauma manifesting itself in different ways. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's the woman on the wall, right? She refuses to give up. And, and if, you know, if, you're, if you're sensitive to, the, to what the movie's doing, he is thinking of giving up. Mm -hmm. I mean, he walks into that peanut butter sandwich scene and says, maybe we don't do this anymore. And for, for Captain America to get to that place, you know, that's even in the support group scene, he's telling people what they need to hear. But the look on Evan's face means I, I'm not taking my own advice. Yeah. I'm not moving on. Maybe I need to, you know, to, to behave differently. Uh, that was always, you know, we, we didn't. Do, is it the five stages of grief? How many stages are there of grief? Psychology students? Five. We didn't set out to do five stages of grief, but we sort of did, right? <laughs> uh, Thor uh, goes one way. Uh, Clint Barton goes another way. Tony. You know, you know, Tony accepts it and moves on. So there's definitely, um, we didn't want to treat everyone like the same football. That's, when you have so many characters, you really have to work hard to carve out different lanes for people. So in the case of Hawkeye, you went to a very dark place. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, was, was there any decision about how far you can go? What do you want to do with that? I mean, there was some talk of, of how, what we could show, but uh, we always <laughs> wanted... He stabs a guy in the middle of Tokyo. I know. <laughs> I mean, we show quite a bit. Um, but he is... Yeah, rage is... And particularly thwarted, ineffectual rage is, is, is a, a powerful thing to see on screen because it's so powerless, you know. Um, so it was always fun to take him there. And the character exists in the comics, Ronan, who it's actually sort of passed from person to person pretending to be this Ronan. Um, so it was a place he had gone in the comics in a completely different set of circumstances, but it was nice to pull that thread from there into the... Well, he had the, he the, had the price of losing his children. Yeah. It yeah. Very, more than the other... I mean, Akira's lost everybody, but he, they lost, he lost all three of his kids, so that was... Yeah. yeah, in many ways, he's the spine, right? You see what happens at the very beginning of the movie. You see his response to it. He get, you see you know, he gets his family back, although what... Thanksgiving dinner's like at the Martin house now that dad is murdering, <laughs> yeah. you know, people for five years. How many years. people did you kill, dad? It's not important. So, Past the grave. So many. Yeah. <laughs> With uh, a knife. <laughs> uh, so obviously, they're all, we got Tony Stark, who is still wrestling with Peter Parker's death, mm -hmm. yeah. but he kind of gains a new child. Like, yeah. it's almost like yeah. swapping children. Uh, how did you use this, the, the loss and gain of the story, to kind of show the consequences or potential consequences he has to do for his decision? Mm. Or risking his daughter's life, actually, to maybe uh, resurrect is. Peter? Well, we wanted there to be positive outcomes of, of the snap so that it wasn't just misery. And Tony, his life has 
gone just about as perfectly as he's always wanted it to do, and particularly as Pepper's always wanted it to. They, they pulled away from crime fighting. They pulled away from the in, industrial side of things. They have a family, and it is he is as whole as he's ever been in the MCU, thanks to Thanos. Um, it's a it's a strange place to be, uh, and he might be in a little bit of denial about it, but it's it is. It's good, and we really wanted because he's so integral to to reversing or not reversing it, but solving it. Solving it to have somebody who's who's like, well, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure I want to fix this. Yeah. He's this refuses the me. call to action. I mean, to, yeah. to boil it down to sort of Joseph Campbell stuff, like, are you going to be a hero today? No, thank you. I reconsider that, uh, and he jumps into the fight. Yeah, it's interesting because he, um, it's interesting because usually this kind of thing in time travel is very exposition. In this situation, you actually had emotional stakes when he, the easy part is figuring out time travel, the hard part is <laughs> no, whether he whether actually dramatically it. will do yes, it. Yes. And it actually, by the way, wasn't the only consequence. It could have had consequences in the universe too, mm -hmm. other consequences. Right. So it's, um, all right, so Ant-Man has always been a great comic relief character, and was, we, need, we definitely needed that. But I was actually struck by the scene where he sees his daughter oh. for the first time. Oh, uh, yes. how, well, how did you feel about Paul Rudd's delivery of that scripted scene the way you guys read he it? He crushes it. That's the thing. Like, you know, he's, he's so funny, and he does all these funny things, but he also, you know, he's done plenty of serious roles. I, you know, I don't yeah. know how, how, if those movies register you know, in, in the consciousness, but uh, I cry in about five different scenes in this movie, and that's... <laughs> the first one, um, because it's a, it, it just milks it. Right? <laughs> it takes a long time for that girl to get to the door. If you know anything about Ant-Man, you know that girl is supposed to be eight years old, and that's not an eight-year-old, and it's, oh, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. But it's all, and it's just, and you know, some of these things are planned, and some of these things sort of are happy accidents because of the way the MCU has evolved, but to have that one character off on a thread that wasn't in Infinity War. And to have him come back, you know, who, if, you know, if he was a freestanding character without a family, he'd come back and be the guy who wasn't affected by Thanos yeah, right. and would be able to fix things. He comes back and he's immediately affected by what happened. Um, so it was just so, it worked out very nicely, you know. You know. It also kind of sets up well, even if, if you think about for future movie TV, what's going to be like for characters to come back five years later. Yeah. yeah. Like that's, you know, I don't want the attention, but it will be something interesting to watch. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a thing they we couldn't explore that much in the movie. You'll notice there's very few non-movie stars in the movie, right? There's not the green grocer <laughs> and the butcher and the psychiatrist. Like they're just not in the movie. Um, so you didn't have a lot of time for scenes of regular folks like us, you know, living through the, the snap. Uh, so you have a, you know, we pay lip service to it. There's a few boats collecting around the Statue of Liberty and things like that. But you're right. I think it's better explored in the, maybe in the streaming service and things like that. You know, it, because again, remember what we did. We did this and then five years later, and that means everything in the Marvel Universe, every character either lost five years or lived five years that other people didn't mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not right, it, it. but somebody, somebody's <laughs> going to have to track all that. <laughs> <laughs> so another character who's found some peace is Hulk. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was the decision to merge David Banner and Hulk together at this point in the uh, Avengers saga? Uh, Infinity War saga. Well, David. that was the one other, in addition to the Hawkeye scene, thing that transferred from Infinity War over to Endgame. That was originally supposed to happen in the middle of the battle in Wakanda, uh, where he's been struggling, can't get the Hulk out. The Hulk finally comes to him while he's fighting Call Obsidian, the Hulk bursts out of the Call Buster, uh, Hulk Buster armor, and yay. And he's the perfect combination. He's intelligent and, and brawny, and he rips Call to pieces. And it was totally, totally wrong. Hmm. It, it was a win right where we needed to begin the biggest loss in MCU history, and it was just sort of like, boy, this, it, it's amazing it took, like, we shot it. It was, you know, pretty well along in the visual effects department for people to go, like, this is wrong. It's not supposed to happen. And, but the problem is we had already shot Endgame, which began with him already smart Hulk. Mm. And so 
when they told us, we're going to cut the Smart Hulk transformation out of Infinity War, we're like, yeah, no one yells more it's than kind the of a then. big yeah. jump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so there was pre the five year jump, there was some scrambling to digitize in Mark Ruffalo yeah. in a place where the Hulk used to be, because um, he was actually the Hulk was in those scenes. But the, the, this is the happy accidents of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like um, the five years later is meant to move your six original Avengers along and you know, see what they've changed into. You know, Thor has obviously gone through transformation. Tony, Clint, Natasha, they've all gone through. If we had done that and made him Smart Hulk at the beginning, uh, at the end of the previous movie, his transformation would just be very minor. It'd be by yeah. degrees. Yeah, the intent was he was the only superhero left. And so if you went and saw the re-release, or if you have the DVD, um, there's a scene we, we cut early but shot where, where it's kind of an 80s scene on purpose uh, where he's uh, saving a bunch of people from a burning, burning building. And then all these uh, reporters come and say, Hulk, Hulk, Hulk. And he goes, no, 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 it's not about me. They're the real heroes over here. You know, uh, you know, smash those grades, that kind of stuff. And Reginald Vell Johnson. And Reginald Vell Johnson from uh, Die Hard was in it. It was really great. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't need that because it was about the transformation. And we, so that's why we wrote the diner scene because we needed to explain uh, you know, now he's gone from Bruce Banner to Hulk and it's all off screen. We better make that a nice juicy uh, pancake scene. But, but in yeah. the end, the end effect of it is, is funnier and more entertaining than seeing it happen. Mm. And it's also such a, you know, it's, it's the one thing they haven't done with the Hulk. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an obvious move <laughs> in a way. So you don't have to over explain it because when you see it, you get it. Now, the other happier, usually lighter character was Thor. Mm. But the, the, you show him very vulnerable character deal, dealing with depression, PTSD, and alcoholism, and using you know, pain, to, a humor to mask his pain. What was the decision to go with Thor in this direction? It was another one where <clears throat> there was nowhere else to go with that character. It was, he had been on a mission of vengeance in the last movie and failed. You can't send him on another one. Right. He's like, hey, this time I swear I'm not going to fail. So, you know, we were toying with things he could do that were very Thor-like. And eventually we were like, you know, where you just be drunk in a bar. If this happened to any of us, we would right. be drunk in a bar. Um, and I think we all just went, well, let's put him in a bar. Right. I mean, eventually Which, was not in a bar, yeah. but... And what's the extension of that, you know, and then how can we, how can we manifest that? And if we put 150 pounds on him, you know, what, what's that going to feel like and look like? And uh, it's, it, again, we didn't want to treat all the Avengers the same, but we wanted them to all have the same moment to deal with and wanted them to deal with it in a different way. I also think it makes, let's the audience connect more to the character because this is a real, we could all understand, like I said, we'd all wind yeah. up in the bar yeah. like that. Yeah. This one character could be us. Yeah, yeah. Stra strangely, like, he's strange. thousands yeah. of years old. Yeah. Has killed fifteen thousand people. You know, like no, no, he's killed. He's killed three thousand. Three thousand people. He's five thousand years. How old is he? He, uh, he said he's fifteen hundred years old. Fifteen hundred. I many gave many him ten times. He's a mass murderer of people. Yeah. Stop <laughs> idolizing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stop idolizing. <laughs> but <laughs> weirdly, the Thor arc has always been, you know, I'm born a prince. I'm meant to take over this kingdom of gods. His arc has always been toward denying that and becoming a human. Yeah. So this is really this the culmination of where he's been going since the first movie, which is basically just doing what his mom says in this movie, is don't be who you're supposed to be, be who you are, and who you are is this. Yeah. And that's why we don't have him lose weight and shave at the end of the movie, because that's Thor. That's who he's supposed to be. This, well, I mean, not supposed to be. That's who he that, is. This, uh, the second act addresses these, these questions are all sort of first act questions. And it occurs to me that we're answering them in a first act way because we know where, the, where, where they're going in the second act, right? Like, we want Steve to realize I can put my, my shield down when the fight is over. How do I, you know, wh where does that, what does that mean I do? Ah, the past, Peggy Carter, right? Um, Thor, I. I've been fighting with myself about taking the, the mantle of, of king of Asgard for so long. What is he, what's best for him? Don't take it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Who gets him there? It's like, you know, so it's part of it, it's, it's this whole, takes a lot of work, but it's, it's you know, you, 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 it, 
it's weaving together all the threads to get you where you want to go at the end. It was that Jordan Peele was here saying, his, whenever he has problems in his script, it's usually in Act 1 and 2 because yeah. he hasn't set up the payoff of Act 3. Mm. Yeah. You know, That's so right. it was a... Uh, all right, so now you have a new challenge, uh, a plot challenge. You have the Infinity Stones and time travel. So how did you decide where are they going to go? How are we going to do the time heist without sort of changing the emotional journey of the characters? Right. Well, uh, it looked very much like it looks in the movie, which is a lot of us sitting around in a room with things on the board, pictures of the stones, and lists of where they'd been in the MCU or places it, it had been implied they'd been. Uh, and trying to figure out what had the most emotional weight because if these missions were just go back and get a stone and they went back to a place you've never been before with a bunch of people they've never met before, you wouldn't get any character drama. Out That's of your it. bathroom it just, break. It would just yeah. be a heist. Yeah. Um, and there's so much left unresolved in all of their backstories and you know, this is a 22nd movie so there's a lot of stuff back there. So suddenly, Yes, it has certain elements of a clip show where you're like, let's, let's take a victory lap, but it's also, let's go back and maybe try to resolve the things that were left unresolved, and particularly when you want to take people off That's the board the in a... I mean, the thing was, a bunch of people die at the end of Infinity War, it's tragic. A bunch of people die and or leave at the end of Endgame, and it's victorious. <laughs> it is a victorious sadness, you know, and you can't kill them and be happy about it unless A, it's their choice, and B, they've solved the issues that have been tormenting them up till that point. And the only thing left for Tony was his father, mm. Thor gets to talk to his mom, Steve gets with Peggy Carter, and everything kind of yeah. solves. It's the, it's the ambition, right? We're going to say goodbye to these people that makes us then say, all right, what Let's take any opportunity we can to solve them. Because Chris is right. If, if that wasn't the mission, if we weren't going to say goodbye to people, would we have worked so hard to, to make sure that they address the, the various outstanding issues in their life? I was, I was actually I was very moved by the Thor mother scene. Hmm. I yeah. think anybody who's lost a parent having that moment yeah. it was it, yeah. it's a dream moment, but it was yeah. you know, obviously you know, saying you can be who you are. But yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's ridiculously simple, uh, but it's, she's great at it and probably has yeah. more lines than she had in all the Thor movies combined. You know? and it, <laughs> like that's, it was a great so, dramatic no, moment. No, she's great. And, uh, Tony and his dad I, I like yeah. a lot. Particularly, you also get to sort of just soak in the weirdness of time travel. Yeah. Like the emotional weirdness of it, where you, this man's wife is pregnant with me. <laughs> <laughs> it was also the first time Tony was kind of off his game, though, yeah. emotionally. Yeah. Like you can see he was actually really affected by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so you wrote Captain America. How was it seeing Captain America face off with each other, seeing where his character's gone from till well, today? Well, thank you. Yeah, that's the idea. It's, it's not, it's, you know, the idea that Cap versus Cap fight, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Let's, in a, that's a three by five card really mm -hmm. early on on the board, right? But why is it more than just smashing your, you know, your, your uh, figures together? It's because the older, wiser Cap can kind of see the strength and flaws of young Cap, mm -hmm. the, which is very often in your characters, the strength is their greatest flaw, right? So the idea that this guy can do this all day and that he's never gonna give up is also yeah. what is dragging Steve Don't down. Don't do it all day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so Plus, you can see it's a little relentless. Twice the ass, right? <laughs> when you got two of them. <laughs> really, really? Yes. I would say that's sophomoric, but these could all be sophomores. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you are at a major American university. But it actually did set up well, showing that, and then cutting to back in time when he looks at Peggy. Like yeah. the moment through the glass where yeah, now you're definitely absolutely. laying the groundwork for, yeah. you know, the end. Yeah, uh, and the, the compass falls out yeah. and yeah. it freaks out both of them and it, yeah. Yeah, it worked out. So Black Widow's been on a great journey. She's always trying to erase her past, mm -hmm. you know, make up for everything. Hawkeye's on a slightly different serial killer path. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the challenges in writing the Soul Scones sequence? Because you're obviously taking a different approach than Thanos and Gamora. You want it to be an actual sure. sacrifice. Yeah. Right. Um, well, it was a sacrifice for Thanos. He was quite upset. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Gamora well, didn't have much of a choice. <laughs> but one, we needed to put two characters there who g did genuinely love each other. You know, we had options to put Rhodey and Rocket there, and so, oh, 
Mm. Like they love each other. That's, that's healthy respect. <laughs> it's, it's pretty easy to throw a raccoon off a cliff. Uh, By the way, I don't think that's true. No. Well, if you're in a giant metal suit, it probably gets easier. Uh, so we wound up with those two, and it was, and we had written ourselves into a corner because we made up the rule in the last movie, is you've got to chuck someone you love off of there, and it's the only way you get it back, and there is no way around it. So we knew, well, that mission is going to require somebody, somebody dying, you know, that's, there's no way around it. And we toyed <clears throat> with, uh, well, what if, what if Hawkeye went over? And that doesn't resolve anything. In fact, it, it does the opposite of what I was saying earlier, is that that's a tragic death. The guy didn't fix anything, didn't get his family back. And Natasha is sort of robbed of, of, of the final maximum heroic moment that finally cleans the ledger and makes her and she really just wanted to bring back her Avengers family. Yeah. That was her only goal. Well, like, that's, yeah. you know, you analyze her scenes, right? Her big scene is the peanut butter sandwich scene where she says, you know, I, in essence, you know, I was, uh, I was a, a dark person and now I found this job and this family and that's all I want is to get them back. And that's literally what she says at Vormir. It's like, I've been working to get to this spot right here. You know, like, let me do this. This is why I'm here. And, and so there's, uh, it's, pre it's the noblest thing in the movie, right? Uh, the only downside is it comes at the end of act two, right? Which is where the worst thing usually happens in your movie. And just in this case, we have an hour left and, those pro and the main A plot problem isn't solved, right? Um, so it's, I, I just love that scene. Uh, um, I think, and we reshot it by the way, um, uh, for lots of reasons, but uh, m mostly because the idea of, of them racing each other to get to go off the cliff and be the bigger hero seem really in character. Yeah. Now, uh, another serious question. Um, if you both had to collect a soul stone, which one are you sacrificing the other? <laughs> oh, you assume we love each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I treat him like yeah. a raccoon. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yay, you bring back half the universe. Mm. Thank you. We're so excited. There's cheers in the audience, mm. and 10 seconds later, Thanos appears, and you just wipe that out. Yeah. Know. How did you approach the timing of all this? Because that timing seems to be very important here. Uh, it is. Well, it is, and it, it, it required a bit of a, some precision, because there was one point where, you know, probably in the first draft, Hulk snapped. Everybody came back, basically to the compound. They snapped everybody back to the compound. They had reunions, they had a pizza party, uh, and they had solved the problem. Then Thanos showed up. And what it meant was the story of the movie had ended. Right. And then there was sort of a, a, an additional fight. Like It was kind of like when, the, when, when Michael Myers gets up one last time when you thought he was dead. It had that effect, it was, like, it was cheap. Um, so we really needed to start the solution, but not get to the people. So we had to have Thanos attack after the snap, but before the return. And that took many edits and drafts for some reason to get that to work correctly. I think we didn't figure out that we were going to split up the teams for these sort of very small, mm. uh, you know, uh, Hawkeye running from Outriders and... Uh, Rhodey and Rocket and Hulk drowning and Ant-Man come to their rescue and then the main three having sort of a Sergio Leone, you know, face off with Thanos. It, that was probably draft four. We figured out that that was the best way to, to treat those 10 minutes. Uh, Did you have any versions, and I kind of know the answer to the question because I saw you at Comic-Con, of okay. uh, maybe when Thanos came back in a darker way mm. <laughs> with, with uh, yeah, something is. else. That's is it. there it any is. other version you might have attempted uh, that uh, might have wanted the thrown something on the floor or the editor room floor? Do you want to tell them? <laughs> <laughs> there was a time where uh, the idea was that back in 2014 when Thanos figured out that the Avengers were doing this, he did not uh, just wait around when he sent Nebula into the future. Because theoretically, you send somebody into the future to bring you back, 
that could take any amount of time because there's time travel involved. So he had time on his hands. So he went to Earth and killed everybody, as he does with other planets. He went to Earth, killed everybody, killed the Avengers, and waited around on the smoking battlefield that is Avengers Compound for Nebula to open up more of a, a time door than a time hole. And so at that point in the script where Thanos comes walking forward, it was this thing had opened up and he walked out of blazing hellscape 2014 Earth carrying something. And the Avengers came to meet him and he stepped up to them and went and Captain America's head rolled <laughs> up to Captain oh, yeah, America's yeah, feet. That is the correct response. <laughs> Gasp. And he's looking at his, and it had a really nice, not only was it just totally screwed up, but it was, <laughs> it was Cap who had traveled back in time and fought his own self, and we had done all this doubling. It was like one last piece of really screwed up doubling in oh, the time it was Yeah, movie. everyone who read it went, I don't understand where we are or what yeah. we are. It's just, you know. But obviously, you know, we waited a year, watched all our characters, half the world die, uh, and then the moment they all come back. Yeah. Yeah. So when you see it on the screen, and I, we'll talk about the, the score, how did you feel when you first saw it on the screen for yourselves with Alan Silvestri's score <laughs> accentuating well, it's the, what you yeah, wrote? Yeah, his, his it, score the score is, is pretty, everything pretty there. Pretty good. Um, you know, when you, this is sort of behind the curtain, when you, when you put these movies together, you're using a lot of temp music, or the editors usually use temp music. Um, uh, and I don't even know when they talk to someone uh, like Alan, do they even, sh I don't know if they even tell him what they've been using, because it's almost an insult that, it's, you know, let Alan figure out what he wants to do, right? Um, but we'd gotten pretty used to the tent music, and the tent music was all at a 10. It was uh, portals open and bam, 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 and, it's, and it is just, it is, um, it's exciting and, ad and adrenaline filled at the beginning. And so I was very used to that, and it took a while to, to uh, Alan did two or three versions of this. Mm. Um, and the one that he eventually did combined everything, right? So it was this sort of elegiac, sort of slow opening, right? Where it's, it's um, uh, uh, the Wakandans come out first after On Your Left, right? And if you know the movies, On Your Left makes your, your, you know, your, your skin prickle <laughs> a little bit. Oh my God. And then the Wakandans come out, right? And they share that look and the music starts to get you know, sort of more powerful, but it's very elegiac to start. And only when you get sort of halfway around does it start pumping. Um, it, it's beautiful that way, and it's mm -hmm. the best way it could be. But it took a while, you know, for everyone to sort of clue into the, what, what Alan was laying down. Is that, like, is that, is that kind of yeah, jazzy? 1958. Yeah, but I'm but the record <laughs> producer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Tony again shows motion when he first sees Peter Parker, mm -hmm. uh, but goes with silence, the hug, mm -hmm. and also his death scene yeah. was virtually silent. So what was the decision for Tony's end? How was we going to handle Tony's end? Uh, well, there were a couple versions of it. One, we felt, it, in the first draft, I think we felt obligated to give him goodbyes to, because everybody there has a story with Tony Stark, and you're like, wow, is Cap not going to get a lot, you know? Last line, and Robert rightly recognized it as the longest death scene, <laughs> and it required him to be dying, but not dying for quite a long time. Uh, yeah, yeah, now you. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like, "No, I don't, I don't want to talk at all," uh, which made perfect sense because he is very, very, very badly injured. You can't talk a lot in that state, and. Uh, and it also brings really kind of brutally home this idea that uh, he, Tony Stark is going to die. Right. Like it's in a, in a real sort of small way that right. feels... His eyes look, though, into Peter Parker's eyes is brilliant. Oh, like he, that, the he, moment he of sees everybody, happiness, right? Like he almost. has a moment with Pep, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what it, it sort of dawned on me as I, as, as I watched the movie more that... Well, two things. One, the guy who never stopped talking finally stops talking, and that's a big moment. <laughs> but that's a serious change. That's right? a moment. Mm -hmm. But also, you and the audience, we all desperately want him to say something. 
I need him to say something, and he doesn't say something. So he is denying me the thing I want, which is exactly what this moment is, because we're taking Tony Stark away from you. Mm. So it sort of mirrors what's going on in the movie. But then we have the fun of giving you him talking again. Then you get, this, you know, the, it comes back around. So we had planted this idea that you could, you know, he could send messages in his own helmet. And so that's why early on on the board, three by five cars, we said Tony delivers his own eulogy. <laughs> And so we figured out a way that he could do that. Although I think, you know, the last line you wrote for him, I am Iron Man, is a perfect mm. bookend, because the first time he said he was narcissistic, yeah. and yeah. this time it actually has such <laughs> right. different meaning. That's yeah. right. And it, that's, that's, you know, we'd certainly written versions of that, but we had thrown it out, and it was our editor who said, that's, this is the line. Cause, and we, had, we reshot it. I mean, we never got him saying it, but we had a bunch of terrible versions, and Jeff Ford, our editor, said, why, he's going to say, I am inevitable. Why doesn't he just say, I am Iron Man? Because we went, it was almost too easy, right? <laughs> no, it's exactly what you got to do. So it's, again, yeah. it shows you how collaborative these things are. Uh, of course, the biggest moment I heard weird screams from the green room is when Captain America gets Thor's hammer. Yeah. Oh, does he? <laughs> yeah. I forget. <laughs> Did you know that was going to draw some fan excitement? Yeah, because it made us excited. Well, yeah, but it... <laughs> I didn't know it would be so emotional. Like, because oh. in, mm. in a weird way, you're really down in the sort of comic book mythology weeds. Like, he, the, you have a super hammer that only one man can pick up. And then another man picks up the super hammer. <laughs> you know, you're like, that's pretty removed from emotion. It's kind of just silly. And then when it happens, you're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's the kind of thing you almost can't, create that it just happens yeah. to be great yeah and it's movie 22 versus movie two yeah. right like you you're waiting for that do you realize a little trivia for you guys are aware that you wrote the last line that robert redford will ever utter on film yes we knew that oh you did yeah we couldn't tell anybody forever because <laughs> yes. like we're not gonna announce and that he's also, retiring from film yeah. uh, on camera yeah he might direct again but he's like going acting. and yeah. it, what is it medic that's right it's an illustrious end to it. That's right. That's right. So Butch Cassidy was his birth, and you ended with uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an honor. It's a <laughs> so thinking a little about the fan experience, uh, how has it been in interacting with the fans? Because they're such a passionate the Comic Con, or even just in general, how has it been for the experience being part of the universe? I mean, it's pretty great. It's not. It, it's grown, right? Because the the films have grown, and our and people's understanding of our role has grown. So that's nice. Again. We can easily walk down the street, <laughs> but uh, but when people say you know realize oh you wrote those things that it's mostly people want to tell me their stories of interacting with the movies yeah right like I was this old when I saw Iron Man and I remember when this happened and occasionally how dare you kill Loki you know <laughs> <laughs> also, it's, that it's the you know we've had you know, mothers come up with their you know, 18 year old son and said, this is the only thing we've been able uh, right. to agree on in the last 10 <laughs> years. And it has kept us together and kept our family together. And you're like, okay. <laughs> um, and I ran into, but, I call them old guys, I'm an old guy, but they were, you know, it was a gray, two gray haired men who have, who have loved comic books their whole lives. And they were like, thank you. Because <laughs> like they've been reading Captain America comic books since they were kids, it has been an impossibility for the what you see on the comics to take to to be on the screen for the vast majority of their life, and then it happened, and it happened in the way they enjoy. It wasn't a desecration of all they hold dear, uh, and that's really kind of moving. It's like yeah. people's whole lifespan is suddenly in your hands. I mean, I. You can go on YouTube and watch people who snuck cameras into theaters, and not necessarily to, um, to to capture the movie, but to capture the reactions of the fans when the various moments happened all over the world. When he picks up that hammer in every language, people mm -hmm. freak the hell out, <laughs> and that that actually makes me choke up. Yeah. Now, do you have any advice for future screenwriters who are going to tackle? Because Disney Plus is now adding Loki, Hawkeye, a, a virtual. There's a lot of just on the streaming service, let alone all the movies. Mm -hmm. Any advice on now the future screenwriters how they got to tie all that together for oh. the next Avengers movie? Uh, it's a higher just wire give, act. Give yourself yeah. permission to do it. Yeah. Uh, when you poor person get that job, <laughs> you're going to be. You're not going to see the sun for a long time. <laughs> 
say goodbye to your family. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, you know it's, it's value them characters as people. That's the only advice I have for screenwriters half the time anyway, is, is just like, yes, that man's a robot and that guy has wings and, and these people live in an altered reality. They're all people. Write about the people and let the magic happen tangentially to that. You know? So the approach you take usually focus on the emotionality first before the fantasy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. we don't know anything about fantasy. <laughs> really, I mean, like, uh, what do I know? I mean, but, but like, if you read our scripts, they don't say Iron Man, they say Tony. They don't mm -hmm. say Cat America, they say Steve. Mm -hmm. And that's all we do, is we're much more interested in the guy who lost everything because he was frozen in the ice for 70 years and then came back and went, what the hell is this? That's something you can write. The guy who's just stronger than anybody else, is, that's not, yeah. there's nothing to do there. Yeah, you, you love Iron Man because you love Tony Stark. Yeah, you don't suit, love him because he's rich. The suit's cool, but you yeah. wouldn't be here if the suit was just cool. Yeah. All right, we have time for a few audience questions, so we're going to run a mic to you. Uh, uh, not to push the, the Tony and Steve metaphor, but what do you two bring to the team, the writing team? What's the thing that you like, your strength that brings that you don't have and you don't have? And then when you have an argument, who wins? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I bring upper body strength. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I just don't like bullies. <laughs> uh, the, the easy, the, so it, it sadly does kind of come down to our different um, uh, mental conditions. Uh, I lean towards the OCD, so I'm pretty hyper organized. Uh, and and so like the three by five cards, the we're meeting at nine o'clock and nine, not nine o five, and uh, uh, and we're gonna get this amount done today. That's sort of my engine um, uh, and Chris is a little more ADD <laughs> so he is reluctant to uh, embrace the, fr the, the first idea. I will easily embrace the first idea. Do we have an idea? Good. That's the idea. Let's go. And Chris is like, what if we wait for the best idea <laughs> and then we don't have to throw out the first idea that we went down the road with. Um, so that's sort of generally how it works, is that I push and he puts his feet down and then we kind of eventually I'm, get I'm to where we're going and it's, ass. well, it's much better than, than if I had just been running off half cocked. Or if we were both super enthusiastic about the first idea we had, right. we'd have a lot of really crappy first drafts. Right. Or, or if neither of us wanted to work that day, we wouldn't work that yeah. day. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you guys... Like, there's a lot of different types of time travel that you'll see in different movies. Did you always go with the changing the past won't change the future? Or was there ever an idea where the future might be affected? Or, like, a, like a, you can't change anything, and everything that you see them doing in the past actually sort of happened, and we just never saw that before? Uh, right. Well, that last, one, mm -hmm. that last one is, is our slight get-out-of-jail-free card on, on our uh, Steve Rogers goes back in time and stays there theory. But it's a, it's a pocket theory. Uh, no, we never practiced the uh, Back to the Future time travel template because it's just impossible on a storytelling level when you have that many people going back. Right. Uh, I mean, imagine, every, if you're familiar with Back to the Future and Back to the Future 2, um, in Back to the Future 2, Biff, uh, becomes successful because he gives his younger self the almanac to bet on sporting events and therefore Biff becomes a, a millionaire. Uh, and so there's this ripple every time he goes back. If we were to have a ripple every time we went back, exponentially it would be crazy town. And we would never be able to fix everything. So we were stuck. I mean, remember, we're, we're, we're thinking about using time travel to solve the problem, and yet we don't have a model for time travel that would allow us to do it cleanly. Um, until we had actual, we, we brought two physicists in, and we said, hey, <laughs> <laughs> between you and me, <laughs> A, it's not possible, right? And they go, no, it's not possible. <laughs> and we go, B, if it were possible, how would it work? And one of them literally said to us, well, Back to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> and we went, oh, that's very interesting. Tell us more. Uh, and they posited that it would work more as a branch reality idea, uh, that um, uh, you know, particles, the same particle can exist in two places at the same time, which they've sort of learned at, 
at, at the quantum level through the Hadron Collider and things like that. And so when scientists say this model you're playing with might be legit, we ran with it. Yeah. Le this is less <laughs> than, than, than that. that. But that it, <laughs> it is a testament to Back to the Future and how great those movies are that it, when everyone think, thinks time travel, that's what they think of. Yeah. That you're, but even you're then, disappear. like, they never, like, when, when his family's vanishing from the photograph. Yeah, you're never. You in, never cut to 1985 yeah. and, like, there's half and there, his mom yeah, walking around because <laughs> half of him disappeared. No, no. Like, even that just it's, doesn't it's, make it, any The point of view is very uh, judicious. <laughs> Well, we have time for our last question we always ask all, right. uh, all our guests. I didn't know this. Yes, it's one of those uh, big questions. So uh, we have a lot of aspiring screenwriting students uh -huh. in the audience. Uh -huh. So if you would recommend a movie or a script that you inspired you, probably going to screenwriting or something that you think they should study or view, what would it be? Ooh. Hmm. I mean, they're... The one that got us into screenwriting, and it's, it's so, again, you can only tell our stories, but like, Chris and I met in grad school at UC Davis, um, and we, uh, we were writing novels and short stories and such, and, and looked at each other and went, what are you going to do when you get out of here? I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the idea of Hollywood had sort of cropped up, and we had seen, we went with a bunch of friends uh, to see a, a movie called Seven, mm -hmm. and Seven mm -hmm. scared the pants off us. <laughs> and it's... Uh, I don't know if it, I think it probably does in the screenwriter community, but I don't know if the layman knows like how, how much of a Swiss watch that movie is and how it subverts your expectations. And, you know, and I think it might be easy just to think, oh, it's a gross, scary, serial killer movie. Most of the gore is in your head. You know, like it's, they, you, it, it's still photos maybe, but the things that are happening aren't happening on screen because they're late <laughs> to all these murders. Uh, and then he walks into the, you know, it's a spoiler alert, right? Uh, bad guy walks in at the end of act two and gives himself up. And you have no idea where this movie is going at that point. That really, uh, it I don't know if it inspired us, but it intrigued us greatly. Like that's, that's writing up there and it, we had an emotional experience with it. To the, to the point where our first script was a thriller and it was terrible, right? <laughs> but we had seen that and went, well, let's write a thriller. Mm. Yeah. Which are a bad thriller. Yeah. Uh, and it's weird. I mean, some of the movies where I find the script the most satisfying aren't necessarily my favorite movies, although I like them. But uh, the ones where I, there are certain ones where you watch it and you go like, Jesus, that works perfect. It's all right. It's probably important. <laughs> uh, like the one I go back, it's not my favorite movie. I like it, but uh, Die Hard. <laughs> I do the script, script. It's a good script. Just machined perfect. <laughs> like every time I watch it, I just go like, Jesus Christ, it's so it you you have a visceral satisfaction mm. to the way things are interlocking and you know it's just wildly fun. Um you know, my favorite movie is Chinatown. I wouldn't necessarily advocate anybody try to imitate that, right. you know. Right. Uh, so, but, you know, I think it's more being inspired by movies that make you, that elevate you into a place where you're not just watching the act structure um, and then going in and finding that that act structure is actually in there. Right. Is the you know if you can use a very solid spine and then make people forget about the spine entirely, that's when yeah. you know the magic has happened. Well, I mean, uh, Endgame has been such a cultural and uh, cinematic phenomenon. We're so glad you guys came with us and shared your experiences of making the movie. Thanks, thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.